we're good, we're good. All right. Uh, imagine, if you will, it's Sunday night. You're brushing your teeth, getting ready, for, ready, getting ready for bed. Are you looking forward to work the next morning? Is it even really work because you love it so much you'd be doing it anyways in your free time? Or did I just kind of bum you out by even invoking the concept of Sunday night? This is nobody will train you but you. This talk will give you the tools to do what you love every single day for the rest of your life because you'll be so freaking awesome that people will line up to pay you money for it. This is me on the internet. My name's Zach. Uh, I work for Test Double. I started with them last week. So if you ever want to really spike out your anxiety level, uh, start a new job with people who are way, way smarter than you, and then give a talk at a national conference the next week. It's uh, been kind of amazing. Uh, Test Double focuses on building apps with uh, a lot of user interactions. Think Backbone or Ember or Angular, and then think of those uh, being used to build maintainable software. It's an amazing concept. Um, a year ago, though, I wasn't a developer at all. I uh, was doing direct mail analytics, which is approximately as exciting as it sounds. Um, I was absolutely drowning in work. I, Goog I Googled this Rails thing on May 2nd of 2012. It's a framework. It's kind of popular. You might want to give it a shot. Um, within a couple months, I was hired as a junior developer uh, after shipping that first Rails app, and almost immediately almost immediately bumped up to developer-flavored developer, junior no more. Uh, hired Test Double last week, and then that's today, RailsConf, yay. <laughs> so, um, oh, thank you. So, um, I'm not telling you this to brag. I'm not telling you this only to brag. Uh, <laughs> I see a lot of people who seem to be waiting for something. Uh, maybe they're waiting for rescue or they're waiting for permission. Uh, but month after month, they look at these Sundays just strung out in front of them, and every single Sunday, they just can't stand going to work the following Monday. And I'm not quite sure if they think somebody's going to give them permission to do what they love, but it's not going to come. You have to do this on your own. When I first started, I wasn't so good at the whole Ruby thing, right? I was pretty notorious for, uh, for using, the heck out of Google, using the heck out of Google. I was accused of using Shadow Google, this, this parallel search engine that only I had access to because I could find these gems to almost do the thing that I wanted to, just so much better than anybody else. Gem install hairball, right? Uh, but after about two months, I realized I wasn't getting any better at all. I talked to one of my friends about this and asked them if maybe Stack Overflow was rotting my brain. He didn't buy it. Uh, he told me that I just needed more time. I was being too impatient. After two months, I should expect to still kind of suck. Um, it takes more and more conversations with the compiler to get better. It's like, okay, okay, that's, that's cool. So we, we go back to pairing that afternoon, and I don't remember exactly what we were working on. Maybe it was, uh, I, th I think it might have actually been a Rails migration we wanted to do in a single transaction. That way we didn't need to uh, have that really long wait for a large table multiple times. And I went onto the web, searched for the syntax, and on his browser, there's just this big wall of visited links. It's almost like he'd been there before, right? And if that was my browser, I would have seen the same thing. Just walls of purple. So he'd obviously not got, had enough conversations with the compiler e either. And we do the migration and get back into the model and finish up whatever we were working on. And neither one of us could remember what we were, what we were working on. It just completely fled our brains. And it kind of strikes me that this is bullshit. Like, we're not naturally getting better, and each one of these searches is expensive. It's a context switch. As programmers, we know how expensive these context switches are. It's just like being tapped in the shoulder and interrupted. It costs about 10 minutes, per pop, 10 minutes a pop. 
If you're in a situation where, where you only have three hours of productive time during the day, which is pretty common, nine trips out to the web for some syntax you didn't quite know, that's half of your day gone. That's an hour and a half left to work. I'm not good enough to get all my work done in an hour and a half. Maybe you are. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, though. Corey Haynes talks about when you need to go out to the web to, and do a search for something you don't know, make it your own after the fact. Each time I do a search, I'll write it down in an index card. I'll write the answer down on the other side. Uh, when I have a little bit of free time, I'll review it. I'll make it my own. Typically, just the act of writing it down on paper, it has some really great features, by the way. It's flexible. It's uh, really visible in the sunlight and has excellent battery life. Uh, but the act of writing it down seems to just cement it, cement it into my brain in a way that typing it doesn't. And the way copying and pasting it sure as heck doesn't. Uh, this would be a pretty common one right here. My previous position, I'd see this all the time. We were doing business intelligence, dashboarding. Dashboard is a verb now, uh, in case you were unaware. So we would have these text files as inputs, and eventually we'd have a backbone front end as an output. So I'd have this collection of strings, and I didn't want the whole string, I just wanted a piece of the string and regex as a dump. Uh, I took a break from being angry at regular expressions long enough to learn this recipe. And it was just a recipe, but I was able to apply it to a bunch of different situations. Uh, so suddenly, there was this whole category of problems, I didn't have to go out to the web anymore. I could just adapt this. Here's another one. We get a hash, and we want a slightly different hash, or maybe a, a radically different data structure. Now I have each with the object in my pocket. Anytime I have this class of problems, I can adapt this. And we look at it, each with object. It's pretty, it's not complicated. It's not the first time you've seen it, but when we're looking at a blank screen, a blank text editor, a blank piece of paper, we can't pretend that we got it. Right? Each with object was just up on the screen. Do you know off the top of your head what the order of arguments are on that? Do you know how to use each with object versus inject just off the top of your head? Um, that's important, right? Just knowing it and just being able to recall it quickly gives you a huge advantage. Uh, so since I started doing this, I'm so much faster now. I can't tell you how much faster I am. Should probably try since I'm up here giving a talk about why this is a good idea. Um, I'm probably twice as fast, maybe a little bit more, and I find myself being more creative too. I had a German teacher in high school, and before he failed me, he told me to think in German. <laughs> uh, because when you're fluent enough in a language to be able to think about it, you can compose new sentences. You, you're not just reading off of a phrase book. When you're fluent enough in Ruby where you don't have to keep going back to the web, you can start making these new connections. You can start uh, to use lateral thinking, thinking outside of the box if we feel like douching it up. Uh, but this only gets us so far. Uh, each with object isn't going to teach me about dependency injection. Uh, regular expressions, they're probably not going to teach me about composition. We need to find a way to know what we don't know that we do not know, you know? Um, the unknown unknowns. Thank you, Donald Rumsfeld, for popul popularizing this. Uh, black swan events, if you're feeling fancy. So for anybody who's not familiar with this concept, there's the stuff I know, there's the stuff I know that I don't know, the entire last, the last section, right? The entire last section, uh, I know that I didn't know how to do a Rails migration in a single transaction when I was also involving indexes because I had to freaking go up to Google, right? It's obvious. But the unknown unknowns, that's the dark matter. That's the interesting bit. It's unmeasurable. Uh, you can tell it's unmeasurable because it's in a pie graph that's 
kind of measured looking. Um, so an, an example of this for me was a lob demeter. Uh, lots of syllables, it's fancy sounding. Uh, it's the dot law, but not really the dot law, but yeah, kind of the dot law. You can pick your friend, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. I mean, I, I'd heard about this. Uh, it's the easiest uh, of the solid principles to misrepresent. But it wasn't until I was putting more of my code under test and like, trying to drive the corner cases of a bug in software. It's kind of redundant, right? I had software, so it was obviously I had a bug. So I was trying to like, drive the corner cases out of this bug, and each time I wrote a new test, I had to instantiate three other unrelated objects. It was a pain in the ass. So about 20 minutes in, it kind of hit me. Now, it wasn't a lightning bolt. It, was more like, it wasn't a light bulb. It was more like a lightning bolt. It's like, oh, crap. This test pain, this, is, this shouldn't suck so much. It means that the way I have my code structure is probably pretty bad. And if my tests are experiencing this, then, oh, right. That means if those incidental objects change, if their APIs change, then other unrelated objects are just going to shatter at the same time. It was through that test pane that I gained just a little bit of wisdom. Wisdom like mustaches and mullets must be earned, not grown. The indomitable Leon Gersing. I always have the way, of wor way with words. Uh, I earned that bit of wisdom. But we don't have to sit around and wait on somebody else's schedule to earn more wisdom. It doesn't take X number of years. Through extra, extracurricular activities, we can go out and pick our own fights. We can advance beyond our years. So how? Well, we're open source developers, or at least developers using open source libraries and frameworks. If Google has all of the world's knowledge, then GitHub must surely have its wisdom. I'm really jealous if you can look at somebody else's source code and get a lot of wisdom from that, because I can't. Process cannot be inferred from product any more than a pig can be inferred from a sausage. It is possible, however, for us to follow the process forward from blank page to final draft and learn something of what happens. Just because we're looking at somebody else's source code doesn't mean we have any idea why those characters are sitting there dead on the, dead on the screen in that specific order. We need the micro steps. We need the minutia. It's the only way we're going to gain that wisdom. We're lucky in the Rails community. We are lucky in the Rails community, though. We have these brilliant tutorials and books for us to gain that wisdom. Uh, I think Michael Hartle is here in the uh, conference somewhere. Uh, I went to Michael Hartle University, building it uh, with the Ruby on Rails tutorial, right? That's what I use to bootstrap myself. Uh, Sandy Metz is at the conference too. Make sure to say hi to her. She has this amazing book with a lot of words. Um, Object-oriented object design with Ruby. Yeah, yeah, something. And it has like, the word Agile in there, too, because it's a book. Um, alternatively, Patterns, right? It's an amazing book, though. Uh, but we have all these amazingly detailed tutorials out there, some of them available for free. Uh, I've recently been teaching myself more JavaScript lately uh, after having join test double, and let me tell you how lucky we are in the Ruby community for the tutorials we have. Uh, one of my favorites is build an app with Corey Haynes, which is not just something on my bucket list. It's a screencast series. Pretty awesome. There's also Objects on Rails by Avdi Grimm. And the one I want to talk about today, Sucks Rocks. It's part of the Destroy All Software screencast series. Uh, currently, subscriptions are, are suspended on this. Uh, he is going to open the gates back up at some point, though. Uh, this is the perfect tutorial for me, or, or, or was the perfect tutorial for me, still is, and words are hard. Uh, it's super high in context. We're not just building 
uh, bowling scorer with no inputs or outputs, just floating out there. We're creating a web app. It's, got, it's hitting an external API, using a database, and serving JSON, right? Inputs and or outputs. Pretty freaking amazing. It's detailed. At no point is source code just magically pasted on the screen. I freaking hate that in tutorials. And source code, blam! Uh, every single character is typed. We see it. We see each bug being committed. We see the blind alleys, and we, and we recover from them. And this is somebody I trust. Find somebody who you trust, who has skills you want, and who inspires you. Maybe that's Gary Bernhardt, maybe it's not. I have no interest in playing developer Pokemon. Oh, that's Beatrice, by the way. It's one of my parents' cows on their dairy farm. My mom will occasionally take a picture of her with a hat on and just post it on Facebook. She's actually the first cow that's guaranteed retirement because she's become so famous on Facebook, it's kind of backfired on her. This has nothing to do with the talk, by the way. Uh, The eight-part series on Sucks Rocks has a runtime of about an hour and a half. I treated each episode like a kata. I'd watch the episode, take notes, and attempt to reproduce it character for character, going back through time and time again. After the fourth or fifth time, watching an episode of somebody else's screencast, you start to feel a little stalkery. I think, hmm, Gary sounds down today. I wonder if I should send him another severed head. That'll cheer him up, right? <laughs> what do you think, Gary Bernhardt tattoo? Um, I'm just kidding. It's actually on my ankle. Um, it took me 40 hours to fully memorize this tutorial. 40 hours. Turns out he types kind of fast. Uh, that was time I wasn't spending with my spouse, Mary. It was time I wasn't doing billable side work. It was an actual measurable opportunity cost. I wasn't looking at other tutorials, teaching myself other things. So what did I get out of it? You ever heard the phrase testing behavior versus testing implementation? After hearing that, have you ever wanted to kind of punch somebody in the nose because it just it sounds so meaningless? I didn't really get that concept. It's like, yeah, it's not that helpful. This is code that's similar to what's in the original Sucks Rocks app. Originally, it used rbing, which is a Ruby Bing wrapper. That Bing API is long gone. It's been completely overhauled at least once and then completely disappeared in favor of Windows Azure, I guess. So I just swapped it out for the Google gem. This is the fundamental thing that makes the rest of the app run. And it was two lines of production code, zero lines of test code that changed when I swapped it out. This, of course, is a subset of the single responsibility principle. We know that this is important because it has a lot of syllables. And the more syllables a principle or a law has, the more we have to pay attention to it. Uh, this is pretty close. I think this is character for character out of the Sex Rocks app. It might not be super apparent at a glance, but at no point do we allow an active record object to leave the model. And uh, find by term, right? Uh, sorry, uh, for term, save score. That's our own API. We're not using the broad surface area of the, um, of the active record API. Those terms make sense for our domain. Typically, I probably would have structured my app something like this. I would have written my tests first, but they would have been kind of a checkbox. And like, oh, I'll write my test first, and then I'll just smear some more stuff all over the model. Uh, when the tests were allowed to influence the design of the system, though, it ended up looking more like this. 
I don't think this system itself had anvil transitions. Uh, this kind of emerged naturally through TDD. And it was the first time I've seen this truly occur in a Rails app. And it was kind of mind-blowing for me. It was that one of those Wizard of Oz moments. Like, oh, wow, right? And this wasn't what we set out to do either. And this isn't some universal way you should design your apps. This just kind of happened. And it was kind of awesome. And you notice that third-party API, right? It's just sitting there in a the corner keeping baby company. You know, when it changes, it's, it's going to cause fewer breaks in the rest of the system. Think of uh, something like Braintree in some of the Rails apps we've seen. Think of all the places in a user model that would have to change an, an average app if uh, that was being swapped out for, for a different payment processor. On Friday, I'd actually car cargo culted this, this structure into a prototype uh, JSON API backend I was building. And my assumptions were kind of way off, off to the point where we ended up rendering it all server side. It took me 15 minutes to swap the structure of the application around from a JSON API into just a single template rendering because I could gather those purple circles up and just plug them into something else. It was, it was kind of awesome. Uh, but once again, this isn't the universal solution for all of your problems. This is also where I started to fight nil. No method error, undefined method each for nil, nil class. Thank you, Ruby, thank you for nothing. <laughs> Typically, that the origin of the nil isn't even gonna be in that stack trace. I mean, that's the kind of garbage I expect from JavaScript. This is disappointing from Ruby. Uh, some of those nil errors start to sound like urban legend. I once saw a nil originate in one object, travel through two others into a backbone front end and back into the Rails back end and eat a guy's face off, right? <laughs> That's a thing that actually happened. Well, not the face eating off thing. It was only half of his face, but that's a thing that happened. I mean, I had console.log and binding.pry to freaking track down a nil. And we see these things. These things happen. This would have been similar to production code I would have written maybe January-ish. Uh, this isn't part of the Sucks Rocks app at all. Uh, we're hitting some kind of external API wrapper which is my favorite hip hop group, doing some work on it and then returning it. Uh, it's really common to return nils here in Ruby because it's nil happy. By extension, Rails is nil happy too. I mean, if find, if active record find doesn't find something, you know, it's gonna return a nil. If we try to index into an, an array where uh, nothing exists, we get a nil. Uh, this is how I would structure code now using a sentinel object. I was, uh, I was using this at work a few months ago in my previous position, and my partner, she asked me, uh, what, what the heck are you doing, Zach? That's class.new. Exactly how much paint did you huff this morning? And I got kind of excited because Gail's a badass. I didn't get many opportunities to show her something new. I was like, oh, wow, it's my turn. This is neat. So I told her that that's just a, an inert object. Since like no score is a thing that is kind of okay to happen, you know we need something to represent that. But nils are a pain in the ass, and I don't want to return that. Almost on cue, 15 minutes later, we got a stack trace like this: undefined method each for performance no score. Holy crap! That's a stack trace we can do something about. Uh, my last week of work there, we saw a stack, a stack trace similar to this in New Relic. You know, imagine a nil stack trace in New Relic. You probably don't have to imagine that. You, 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 you're probably pulling the app back down and trying to get the database in the exact same state, so that way you can throw a binding that prime there and then follow that thread along, right, and try to protect your face. Um, <laughs> but when you have stack traces like this, it just even from the New Relic um, event console, it, oh, like, oh wow, I know what's happening there, right? That's amazing. I can use this to troubleshoot. Like, 
I have far, far fewer afternoons just lost. Uh, so, I took the tools from that tutorial, the tools that Gary Bernhardt has in his brain, and through 40 hours of memorization, like practicing over and over and over again, and experimenting and trying them in my own projects, seeing where they worked, where they didn't, and when they worked, showing somebody else, hey, this is so cool, look at this. Uh, doing presentations on them. Learn one, do one, train one, like a surgeon, for the very first time, or could be sturgeon. Uh, I kind of made a copy of those tools for myself. And I'm not arrogant enough to think that I'm as good as him or the tools are even closely resemble those. But they're mine, and that's the point. Since they're mine and they're not just a thing that I'm copying and pasting into an editor, I feel comfortable just pulling them out when I think it's appropriate. And since it's not dogma, it's not a religion, I can put them away when they're not the right tool for the job. I still like the Rails generate scaffold because you know, really, quick, uh, really quick demos are a nice thing to be able to put together for somebody, right? I still have my controllers talking directly to my models a bunch of the time because that's perfectly okay. Just because I know how to build a system that doesn't do that, I'm still allowed to build systems that, allow, that you know, do do that. Memorizing a good tutorial like that made me such a better developer. I mean, the code I'm writing is much, much safer because I'm testing meaningful things. I'm writing tests that actually reflect reality, and, so, and since they're not stapled directly to the production code and likely to shatter at the smallest change, now, when I write tests like that, or when I wrote tests like that, I was far more likely to, yeah, I'd have a test suite, but it was dusty and hadn't been run in three months because it was so freaking broken. Um, my code's more resilient, right? So in addition to my test not breaking as often, the rest of the code doesn't break as often because it's not glued together. And I'm a lot faster because I know this, thing, this stuff cold. These things just spring to my fingertips. I don't even have to think about them. And writing down all of my Googles is, 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 and faster here too, right? Remember that two times speed increase. I'm fluent in Ruby. I'm more creative, lateral thinking, thinking outside of the box. And I haven't even told you the best part yet. But wait, there's more. The very best part. Each time I'm on the server side, starting a new project or maybe just a new feature in, in an existing project, every single time I have, the, I have the skill and the confidence to start with just a plain old Ruby object, a Poro. I don't know if I'm supposed to pronounce that. Every time I do that, I feel like I'm back at tryruby.org again for the first time. Can you think of that? Can you think of your first time playing with Ruby? Maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't Try Ruby. Maybe we have pickaxe babies in the crowd or Rails babies. Three dot times, name dot reverse. Like you can't do that crap, right? This is programming. You're not supposed to have that much fun, right? And every time I do this, I'm having a freaking blast. Every time, every day. See, I just lied to you. These aren't tools. These are toys. That's Jim Wyrick up there. He's giving his why not, his uh, why combinator keynote from RubyConf last year. Uh, the code up on the slide that's up on his slide uh, is not production quality. In fact, I think your fingers would be broken and you'd never be allowed to write Ruby code again if you attempted to do that in production. But it's just a thing he's really enjoying. And he's having a lot of fun and he's sharing that. I was watching this video on Confreaks. Uh, last December, and Mary walks in, she sees me watching, and she, she looks at the screen and looks at me and asks me, 
is Santa Claus teaching you Ruby? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so, kind of. See, the very best programmers, the ones that work anywhere they, they want because their resume is their name, the ones that wouldn't put up with a depressing Sunday because they didn't want to go to work the next Monday, because every single day they're just doing the, the thing they love so much. The very best programmers didn't get that way through hard work or just trying to get better. They got that way because they were having so much freaking fun, they couldn't bear to put down the keyboard. My name is Zach. Have fun. <laughs>